Dallas in, and they had a film studio. They had a, a movies thing, and they had they said they called me. They're like they had, I had makeup and yeah, and uh, ha- they called me to see if I wanted hair done. I'm like, you trust me, you can save the expense. <laughs> but it was so funny. But they and then they do fittings. Like I never knew this. Like, yeah, my shirt they wanted to look. They thought it looked too baggy when I sat down. So okay. they had pins that they put in the back, like clips. So if you like, did, if you moved, did it like hurt or like? No, no, oh, it wasn't. Okay. But it was like it was so interesting. I never knew any of this went on. That's like, do you know what I'm saying? Like they yeah, like people... you make you look like very crisp and right. Like, Isn't that funny? Yeah. yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, cool experience. Really cool. Yeah. I'm not as official as. Oh no 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 no! I don't but... have clips in your shirt. <laughs> <laughs> looks good. I don't need any. I, I trust her. Yeah. <laughs> but it was so funny. They they called me and they're like, "Well, do you need a do you need a hairstylist?" I'm like. Imagine if I was so official, like you went into like kind of hair and makeup before kind of this. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, it was really cool. <laughs> but they had a full broadcast studio there where yeah. before like when telecommunications was first coming out. And so they would have all these broadcasts and they would have movie sets and it was really pretty cool. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Take two, here we go. I think we're good. Okay. No, it's gonna be like it's gonna be even better than the first time. Absolutely. I hope. Okay. Hello, this is Genevieve Fontana coming to you from Canisius University in Buffalo, New York, and you're listening to the Did You Know podcast. You might not know it, but we have eco-heroines around our campus working to make it sustainable for future generations. For each show, I will spotlight earth-friendly initiatives and sit down with the change makers of our institution. Today, we are spotlighting Kevin Gavin, adjunct professor of management and marketing at Canisius University. He's a reti- retired store manager for JCPenney, where he worked for 30 years. Professor Gavin has a unique perspective on the institution as an alum for both undergraduate and grad, and also a dedicated member of Laudato C. Thank you so much for being part of this project and speaking with me today. Thank you so much, Genevieve. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so glad that we got to talk. Absolutely. So would you be able to introduce yourself and explain a little bit about what you do at Canisius? Absolutely. So my name is Kevin Gavin, as you mentioned, and uh, I'm relatively new as far as adjunct. I've been teaching, I've taught three semesters, and as an adjunct, I teach when they need me. So some semesters I teach, some semesters I don't. And what I do is I work within the management and marketing department. So um, I, my main course I teach is Management 101, which is Introduction to Management. Uh, have, I've had 27 years of management experience, so it wow. brings, a, yeah. brings an interesting perspective. It's not just what I learned in, in school when I went here as an undergrad, but it's yeah. also everything I did as far as working for a Fortune 500 company um, for 30 years. So yeah. it gives a kind of a different perspective to management because I've actually been in the trenches and, and had to make those changes and tough decisions. Definitely, and I think it's so interesting, and I appreciate how involved you are even when you're not working every semester and everything. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I'm, I'm very passionate about the environment. And as a matter of fact, when I worked for the JCPenney Company, I was on the green team. I was the field representative of the green team for the, uh, the national company, wow. which was really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And then what does your role entail as an adjunct professor of management and marketing at Canisius University? So uh, depending on uh, what I'm teaching, my main course I teach is man- introduction to management. So normally I have 34 or 35 students, and we work through and we take them from the basics of business. How does a business operate? Everything from a basic business all the way to a multinational uh, corporation. And we go through and we study, and they, many of these students have not had background in business. So we take and go through the very basics, and we talk about how a business may grow from a farm stand, from being at a farmer's market, all the way to being a major corporation. Mm-hmm. And we go through, and then we, once we establish the basics of business, we then go through and look at what, how, is, how does management change the world? And in effect, management changes the world. We go through and we, one of the big projects that we do is we take a look at companies, the big companies that failed, and we look at what went wrong. Oh, cool. How did companies go from being a, one of the largest in the country to completely disappearing? Yeah. And we go through and look at the s- level of poor decisions that have been made and things that happen that change the entire environment for the company, but also influence the community and their employees. Yeah. So it's kind of a, kind of a fun project. We, uh, but then we, I really want the, the um, students to learn how and be able to analyze a company and not just say, oh, it's too bad they're running out of business. Yeah. But instead say, what happened? What's next? How could this have been averted? How could they have changed with their customer? How could they have changed with the um, environment as technology changes? Yeah, I think that's so interesting, especially when you're talking like starting from like a farm stand or something so small. Because like, especially now, people's values are more into small businesses and environmental based things so that's definitely how something could grow oh absolutely and so many of our large corporations started with filling an unmet need and so often the consumer did not even realize that they needed that product yeah which is interesting 
Um, you know, when you really look at the companies, one of the, when you study the three companies that we look at, um, you know, we look at Nike or Nike, depending on how you pronounce it, yeah. <laughs> and, and how it started and then how it really came from people having discomfort when they ran mm -hmm. and actual pain and, and foot injuries from running in uncomfortable shoes, like running in Converse sneakers, because yeah. that's what the current technology was. Right. And people didn't even realize it. They want, knew that if they wanted to run, they had to be in pain. But the reality is, is they had the, per, the founder had a vision for running in comfort, and then you know, actually used a waffle maker to get the first sole wow. to create the first sole to give cushion when you run and to structure and to support the foot and to increase speed and all these things because it was an unmet need. People didn't even know they wanted more comfortable sneakers. Yeah, they knew that they enjoyed running. But they enjoyed it even more when the technology changed with them. That's so interesting. It, it, and it's fun, but it's, there's so many companies like that. Yeah. And we go through and we study three companies like that, and we look at how the customer doesn't even know they want it, mm -hmm. but then when they realize it, they're like, "Wow, this is perfect. This is what I need." Yeah, yeah. especially with Converse. Like, um, so my grandparents, when I got Converse, you know, because I liked the way they looked, they were like, "Oh, you're wearing gym shoes," which is mm -hmm. funny, like that you said that. Absolutely. Was, yeah. Absolutely. Even when I was in school, when we would have gym. We would have those uncomfortable sneakers. Yeah. Can you imagine running a marathon in those? Yeah, no, I cannot. So flat. Oh my goodness! <laughs> There's no support. Yeah. They're flat. You know, when you sweat, they get wet. Mm -hmm. You know, everything that could go wrong. But that's what athletes had to do. And if you look at old films of the Olympics and runners back in the day, that's the shoes they were wearing. Yeah, it's nice. and and it's crazy. But the it took somebody to be able to realize that. Consumers don't even know they want this, and all of a sudden, it radically changed the world. Right, and, it, yeah. and people enjoy sports more, and they would participate more because they're in less pain. Yeah, no, I can't imagine, like, especially like the Olympics now, people with oh, Converse on. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and that's, but it's, it's really crazy, but that's, even like old-fashioned basketball sneakers, the Converse were originally the yeah. Chuck Taylors. That's, and, that's what my grandparents were saying, oh, you're wearing black basketball sneakers. Exactly, like, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah. And it's so funny because we're so accustomed to them being the fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, do you know that um, Converse is owned by Nike or Nike? I think I've heard of that okay, before, yeah. yeah. They maintain a separate headquarters so that they way the product innovation is kept different from the, the Nike or Nike product. Yeah, that's yeah. so interesting. Yeah, so we, I try to keep the course interesting and I try to get them to make the connections that business doesn't have to be boring, yeah. but instead it affects everybody's life and, and happiness. It, yeah, and it hits so close to home too because, I don't know, like styles keep coming back, especially oh. with like how big Chuck Taylor's or Converse mm -hmm. were like mm -hmm. then and now and everything like that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's funny because now they come in colors. Years yeah. ago, they came in three Every basic month. colors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what color do you have? A green one. Oh. Like the dark green one. Right. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. But now it's a fashion thing. And then they have limited, um, they have relationships with artists and creative people that do all these unusual designs and things like that. Yeah. But years ago, it came in, I think it was black, white, and red, maybe, mm -hmm. or black, white, and navy. Probably early was probably black, white, and navy. So, but it's all about how it changes and adding creativity to a product. Now people wear them for weightlifting because it connects you to the ground better. Wow. Do you know what I'm saying? Because yeah. as opposed to uh, uh, like a runner, and it also um, probably protects your sh uh, feet a little more. So, yeah. yeah. We were working with um, Stitch Buffalo, which is really close to Oh, right, here. right. Um, and they have a special where they help you embroider your Converse and stuff like that, which is... Oh, cool. that's super cool. Yeah. Because the customization. Nobody's right. going to have that same look, and you're, it's going to make it special for you. Yeah, definitely. Oh, I love it. So as a dedicated member of Ladado C, what does the initiative mean to you, and where do you see this journey taking Canisius? Sure. I think one of the biggest things that I like about participating in this committee is that it allows us to take a look at where we are currently and how can we make Canisius University even better, mm -hmm. more earth-friendly, bring consciousness of, the, of green initiatives to the next generation of leaders. Because it's so important, because so often, you know, it seems like I can't do my part. You know, I'm just an individual, what can I do? And the people do not realize the power of an individual. And when I say that, I talk about, the, like for example, a water bottle. If you use a plastic disposable water bottle and you use two or three per day, not only are you making a financial investment, but it's also bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you use a reusable bottle, okay, and I'll just use a rough example. So if you use three water bottles disposable per day, and they're a dollar each, which they wouldn't be, okay, <laughs> that yeah. would be over $90 per month that you're spending on water bottles. Yeah. And it's also bad for the environment. So by the, the, that one individual, you do the multiplication of it, and it's amazing how much of the impact the consumer can have on, first of all, their, their pocketbook and how much they're saving, 
but also how much they're saving on the environment. And they're reusing that bottle and they're saving a lot of money and it's also better for the environment. Definitely. So it's kind of one of those things that I think is great because that the people will take that from Commissioner's University and it'll impact their life. Yeah. Because it's, you know, the easier thing is, oh, I'm going to grab a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. And you don't always think of the cost of that. And all of a sudden, most people, if you said, oh, you're spending almost $100 a month on water, they'd be like, no, I'm not. And <laughs> like, then, definitely not. And that doesn't even, like, equate kind of, like, just thinking about the, absolutely. the unit price. Yeah. Exactly. And that's conservative. Because as you know, it could be two and three. And right. sometimes if you're at a, yeah. an event at a stadium, it could be six or oh more. Oh, my gosh, definitely. Like, at, um, at the Bills teams, they give out those huge huge bottles and mm -hmm. they're kind or something like that but okay. yeah they're definitely so much more pricey than absolutely that. and the interesting yeah. thing is that category did not even exist when i was in college mm -hmm. that category of water bottles did not even exist yeah. occasionally fancy people would have perrier water you know <laughs> yeah. imported from france but the reality is is most people that was not even on their radar they would use drinking fountains or they might drink pop or something like that but the reality was is that category didn't exist mm -hmm. so it's kind of interesting when you look at it yeah as a matter of fact even the bottle bill for new york state which which is uh, where they get, have a deposit on the um, each bottle that's sold, the pop and right. the air and things. So that did not even include water bottles because in 1982 when that bill was developed, or 1981, that bill, water bottles didn't even exist. Wow. So yeah. it's just interesting how it changes through, throughout, um, you know, the product didn't even exist back in the, the 1980s in effect. I saw recently how they were trying to change the, um, the, the return amount on sure. the bottle. Sure, absolutely. Because it really doesn't matter as much now with all of our prices increasing. 100%. It's not as rewarding. 100%. Like and that. so, for example, but when that first went out in the early 80s, um, a nickel meant something. Yeah. And now politicians are afraid to change that because, oh, it'll be perceived as a tax. And all. But it's yeah. a completely rebatable thing. Mm -hmm. And by doing the financial incentive, you're actually providing the consumer an incentive to recycle. Yeah. And to take them back to be recycled at the store or at, uh, you know, one of these... Um, bottle return places, and there's an economic incentive for them to do that. And what happens is, is they're afraid to change it, but the reality is a nickel, I one time I looked at it, it was maybe two years ago, and it had increased to 13 cents, oh. what would be equivalent today. So if you were, yeah. you know, if you had a quarter on each bottle, you're probably more likely to just return it than throwing it in the trash. Yeah. And those are the kind of things that we need to change. And then there's also categories of beverages that didn't exist. Like I mentioned water, they did adjust the bottle bill. But there's, like, cider was not even an issue back in the, and that's a growing category. Yeah. Um, sports beverages like Gatorade, um, Powerade, all that did not exist, or in limited forms. So all those things change, but it does increase the percent that um, people recycle, rather than yeah. just doing it in curbside. I know now, like, Chartwells is doing the bottle return mm -hmm. thing, and then when you bring, I think they had to increase it to 20 now, but it used to be 10 bottles and you get a free beverage. Mm -hmm. And that was so, like... It was such an incentive for students they would bring so many bottles back like at the end of the week Absolutely. in order to get their drink at the market. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. And that provides the financial incentive. The other thing that's really good from a, what we, I call a reverse logistics perspective, reverse logistics being it's good to say recycle, but how does it then turn into usable product? Yeah. So by the reverse logistics is they return to the store. It has a higher um, recycle rate with stores that have a, or with states that have a deposit but it also has a higher percent of um, ability to be recycled because you're not having contaminated recycles. Yeah. So therefore there'll be a market for aluminum and there, sometimes there'll be a uh, market for uh, plastic in a pure form and glass the same way. Whereas if it's all mixed together, it's kind of questionable whether it'll be recycled. Yeah, and it's so confusing. I mean, I don't think that the system is perfect definitely because of the different numbers on the bottom of the plastic. Absolutely. Because you know, like a one could be reused again, mm -hmm. but like as you get farther down to like the five, Fives. six, seven, mm -hmm. like it, which is definitely used more in our packaging, it's hard to like oh, absolutely. reuse that or find somewhere to recycle that. Absolutely. Yeah. And what's interesting with that is, is you, if from a business perspective, you have to create a market where there's, um, if there's an incentive for people to recycle. So in other words, not only for the people to put it physically to the store or at the curbside bin, but also a market for those products. Yeah. Like one of the earliest categories of um, recycle was uh, corrugated cardboard. Stores would recycle it when they would unpack their boxes, and then they would send it back to be recycled because it was a, a market to purchase that reused cardboard because it was cheaper than actually harvesting new trees yeah. and making, so the cardboard had a, a market. People would actually 
earn some big companies, my company will earn millions of dollars by returning your cardboard. Wow, and yeah. that's a great thing. And it also is good for the earth because you're not ripping trees down. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? For the new cardboard. And there's only a certain number of times you can use it because eventually the fibers get too um, f- um, fragile or whatever. Yeah. But the reality is, is you have to create that aftermarket. So met, like for example, plastics, when you go into like that five, the yogurt containers are the eternal thing. Definitely, Some, yeah. Sometimes it's always that agony. Should I recycle it? Should I not recycle it? <laughs> Definitely. Because a certain, um, the five uh, is the hardest um to um, find a market for because there's not a product that it's, it's convenient. It's right. cheaper to create new plastic. But as oil prices might increase, because oil is used in the production of plastic, as you know, that would, um, that might cause there to create, to create a market for plastics. So, but there has to be a way of developing a market where people will willingly want it. Yeah. Same with paper. Paper is a, uh, can be easily recycled, but there has to be a market for people who will buy the recycled paper yeah. and it's all about creating a, not only to talk about recycling but to also create a market where it makes business sense to pay for the you know the sorting and the, um, the process to convert it aluminum is a great easy very easy item to recycle because aluminum it's it's cheaper to use recycled than it is to harvest um, to you know harvest but to get yeah. new um, to um, create new aluminum products yeah definitely. so yeah. it's a very interesting thing and it's, it's a lot of study and there's a whole thing called packaging engineering that specializes in how do you create more sustainable lifestyle with packaging right and how do we create packaging that's more efficient and so often you buy something and it seems giant and then when you open it up it's like the tiniest thing exactly one of my friends sent me a picture this week um when they were buying books from the bookstore Mm -hmm. they got like the biggest plastic bag ever and the book was this small in the bottom (laughs) absolutely (laughs) yeah absolutely and how do we reduce that yeah you know, did they even need the bag? First right. of all, yeah. you know I mean, did they need that bag? And then the other thing is, is there a smaller bag available that's going to use less plastic, or would a, a paper bag be a better option? Yeah. Would it be more environmentally friendly? And it's a very interesting um, debate. And like, for example, years ago, Ireland, um, I, when I was, my grandparents were from Ireland. So when I visited, and I was with my cousins, and we were in a small grocery store, and um, the, the, the cashier said, oh, do you want to buy a bag? And I'm like, oh. And I was kind of really puzzled because in New York yeah. State, you know, you always get your plastic bags free. So I was like, oh, okay, I guess. And, you know, and they all pulled um, these small reusable bags out of their purses and they put their stuff in their bag because yeah. it would, I don't remember the exact dollars, but it might be equivalent of a dollar per bag. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, we're going to save money by doing it. And their um, use of bags decreased something like 90% right. as a country simply by providing a financial incentive to the consumer and saying, oh, you know what, I can save a dollar, and if I'm buying my groceries for the week, I might save five or seven dollars by bringing my own bag. So you provide that incentive yeah. to do it. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Definitely. And that's why I think it's so smart. Um, my parents shop at Aldi a lot. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, like, the, the paper bag costs less mm-hmm. than the plastic bag costs more. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just all it you know, makes sense in the system. Oh, absolutely. And, yeah. and, and Aldi is based in Germany. Yeah. And what's interesting with them is... They also provide boxes that would have been um, thrown out oh, or yeah, recycled. You, your box and and you, can, the... you can use the box instead of a bag yeah, to carry yeah. it to your car. Yeah. But it's it's also interesting. I don't know if you've never noticed. This is something I'm obsessed with. You know the cashiers sit at Aldi. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever noticed a cash drawer? Um, not really. I okay. Guess. Yeah. Your money is stacked this way oh. as opposed to flat. Oh. Like they do in Europe. Oh, that's cool. It's fascinating. Yeah. But it's the only retailer that I've ever seen where the money is stacked like it is in Ireland and, and England and things like that. Yeah. It's kind of cool. So next time, you ever, if you ever pay cash, you should do it one time just okay. to see it. But the money is stacked standing up. Okay. Yeah, it's really kind I, of interesting. I saw this post on Instagram or something, and it's like how far ahead Aldi is because you really don't need like someone working there, kind of. Like mm-hmm. so you walk in, you bring, you know, you bring your quarter to get the the cart and then you mm-hmm. go through and then at the end you know you get your quarter back because you put the cart in the oh absolutely yeah and it's all about efficiency and their model and we study their model also in my class and we talk about that how they're different than Wegmans at the service level and things like that and how they run on such a small staff and their prices are very low um, but if you're right with the quarter that's a great thing it provides a financial incentive yeah. to get that back oh instead of leaving my car where somebody could hit it or it could possibly if there's a windstorm or you know windy day could hit another car mm-hmm. and instead people are like oh that's my quarter i'm gonna get it back yeah and it's kind of a neat 
um, financial mechanism to prevent uh, damage to the cars and also for the consumer to take the extra steps and, uh, and walk it back. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I know you are a long-term manager of JCPenney. How important is it for large companies to incorporate earth-friendly choices in their business practices? Well, it's huge. And yeah. I will tell you, it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's very, like we talked earlier about the financial incentives, it's great. Of the cardboard and especially. The cardboard too. especially. You know, and that's something that the penny company had done for years. And, and they were very, very efficient at getting that. We have, again, going at, using the term reverse logistics. So they would have the cardboard, you would wrap it up to be sent back to the warehouse. It would then be um, picked up by a, a, a semi and then be taken to the recycler and, and sold. And the actual pounds and things like that would actually save tons of, first off, dumpster space and also provided financial revenue. They used to earn mi literally millions of dollars by recycling cardboard. So they started with that, and then they looked at other means of um, how do you reduce waste and, and things like that. So for example, uh, one of my friends was uh, worked in supply chain, and he used to travel internationally. So he was in, I think it was in China. It was either China or Hong Kong, I can't remember. And he was at um, in the Victoria's Secret plant, where they make the bras, you know, they would have a yeah. large factory. And our bras are made in the same factory. And our brand was Ambriel, okay, which was a knockoff of Victoria's Secret. Got it. <laughs> so he was watching the production line and he would see Victoria's Secret bag coming off the line and they would be put in um, a package of 12 bras would be put in a plastic bag. And then he watched ours and every single bra was individually wrapped in plastic. And he, so he asked the person who worked there, he said, why, are, why is there a difference? He said, well, the, your contract is built that each one gets an individual plastic bag. Wow. And he goes, that's the way your specs are. You know, that's when we have to follow your specs. And he said, well, would it be better if we did it the other way? They said, oh, yeah. Well, first of all, you're going to save a ton of money, and yeah. it's better for the environment. Definitely, yeah. So by making that small little change, save millions of dollars in packaging per year, because this, again, at that point, was an $18 billion company. So mm -hmm. there was a lot of Ombreal bras being sold. And by doing that small change, reduce the amount of plastic significantly. And so, therefore, it was easier to ship because it was, you know, it was all one thing. They weren't falling all over the place. But by making that small little change, it was huge. Yeah. And it's also bringing attention to it. So, for example, um, we never recycled paper, which was always very odd to me because, you know, we recycle at home. Yeah. So, in my store, we would always, I was always obsessive about recycling. I came from my mother years ago. Everything had to be recycled. They'd have yeah. paper drives and things like that for to raise money. And so I, you know, I started putting recycle bins and uh, we do paper and catalogs and ads and things like that. And then um, we, I would take it to a local, those, you've seen those, those bitty dumpsters, the bright colorful ones where yeah. they recycle paper. Mm -hmm. You see them in school parking lots and church parking lots a lot. Yeah. So we would do that and I'd do that every week and I'd fill my car and I'd have almost a car full of paper wow. by the time of all the ads and things that, you know, um, magazines and stuff like that. So we'd, th you know, put it in the recycle bin. So we would have um, these large store manager meetings in Dallas, and I would always ask questions, and I'd always ask hard questions. So my boss yeah. would always be nervous. He's like, oh my God, what's Kevin going to ask? <laughs> <laughs> and the reality is, is that I raise my hand, uh, you know, and I, it's really intimidating because you're in front of 3,000 people. Oh my gosh. And you're, yeah. you know, at the microphone. And, and you like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're at the microphone, and I said, well, I said, you know, and I explained what our store did, and I said, we recycle paper. I said, why is the penny company not recycling paper? And the CEO, dead silence. And he's like, I have no idea. <laughs> and the reality was, is because it was not on their radar, it was not something that they had to get a revenue stream from as far as recycling cardboard and things like that. So we said, well, you know what? He goes, we're going to investigate this. Mm -hmm. And that's when I got named to the green team for the company, which was kind of cool. Awesome, yeah. And we, they eventually um, had a reverse logistics program for uh, paper so that all the paper in the company would be recycled. So we were featured in the green edition of Earth Day magazine wow. for the company. So mm -hmm. it was really cool. Yeah. But the reality is, is because it was not on their radar, there was not a financial incentive. And they're like, oh, that's a great idea. Why don't we do this? And eventually we added, uh, they added to this program through our feedback from the stores, recycling cans. And we would recycle pop bottles at our store. And we'd have a thing. And then we would take that money and we would donate it to charity. Cool. Every month we'd have a different um, group that we would contribute to. So it was a fun incentive for the associates to contribute, but all of those things in big companies, it, it makes it more efficient, profitable, it's good for the environment, good for the customer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and yeah. you know the customer's not gonna know whether the bra was packed in 12 or one, and they don't really care. Yeah, they want it to be easy to buy. Yeah. 
yeah. and they don't care about the minute. But the, by doing those behind the things, it's a behind the scenes thing. And you look at logistics. You know, sometimes you look at say an Amazon. Is that truly the most beneficial thing for the environment? Having a truck deliver every single item to a home versus coming to a Wegmans or coming to a J.C. Penney or coming to a Macy's and delivering it all, and the people as they need it go to the store. It's all about how what is best for the environment. And then you talk about it, and it's a really interesting thing to study and to look at and see how companies want to make money, obviously, but they also want to be good to the environment. And oftentimes, saving money and being good to the environment are the same thing. Yeah. They're not mutually exclusive. Some people think, oh, I can't afford to be green. Well, the reality is that sometimes it makes you more efficient. Mm -hmm. You know, less plastic that's going to, you know, our plastic also is recycled. So at one point, we went from being 75% um, um, recycled to 90%, which wow. was very exciting. Yeah. And, you know, and the reality was is because you had that reverse logistics set up, so you would have an efficient system. So, for example, plastic bags, when they would come off the truck, they would take the plastic off, and they would literally drop into a bag of the same plastic. And then, therefore, the person didn't have to walk all the way across the room to a garbage can. Mm -hmm. And those things sound really minor, but those are huge. No, yeah. If it's easy for the person to do the work, so the worker would undo it, the plastic drop in the bag, and then that would be bundled up and sent back on the truck to our warehouse for reverse logistics. So it's an exciting thing, and, and it's important for um, companies to do that and to make it easy for the employees and also or the associates and also make it easier um, for customers to recycle yeah yeah and it's so interesting because if your friend didn't go like you wouldn't know that your bras were packed that oh. bras were packaged that way unless 100%. I mean I don't know you looked like really really deep into like the contract or whatever but exactly and the yeah. thing is is they you know because they've been doing it for years and so often we get caught up in the status quo mm -hmm. you know this is we've always done it this way and the reality is by him visiting that factory and looking because the pennies was very, very, for years, um, they would send inspectors into the factory to make sure that they were, um, you know, having, following labor laws, making sure that the, there was no human trafficking, all that kind of stuff, yeah. to make sure that it was a quality product. And they had that for years, and they would have people go in. And he just happened to notice. He's like, well, why is ours different than theirs? Because mm -hmm. literally, they're made in the same place. And they're like, well, that's what your contract says. And the contract had been in place for years. And when they finally looked at it, they were like, oh, by changing the contract, we can be better for the environment and being more efficient. Yeah. Yeah. And it's one of those things, but as, but it's saying business as usual. By, so by looking at things, like for example, we talked about packaging. You know, the person who worked in that bookstore probably is used to using that bag because it's probably closer. Yeah. Whereas maybe the smaller bags are too far away. Or even simply saying, do you need a bag today? As opposed to automatically giving it to them. Right. Because people are like, oh, if she's got a backpack or he's got a backpack, oh, I'll just throw it in my backpack. Yeah. Those little things to prevent use. Because when you look at the, the um, triangle of reduce, reuse, recycle, we focus a lot on recycle. And with recycle, like we talked about earlier, you have to have that reverse logistics where there's a market for it. It's easy for the consumer to do, and it's also we have a market to sell that product because you have to take that recycled product somewhere. But you look at the other ones, and we talk about reuse. Or, I'm sorry, um, reduce. So in other words, by that guy touring the factory, he realized, oh, I can reduce the amount of packaging, and yeah. it's great. And even with um, package design, so often you go in and you buy this giant box of cereal, and it's only like this much. Yeah. And but it looks especially more, it's like less and less oh, is in there. Yeah. Absolutely, and they're, they're, it, what, it's kind of a consumer trick to talk, you know think that oh we haven't shrunk the package size, mm -hmm. but the reality is is they got to look at it from a cost perspective too, because some um, shipping companies will charge you not only based on weight, but they'll also charge you based on the dimensions. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I said? It's an interesting thing. So you want to balance between you don't want it to look too um, cheap, but you also want to make sure that the packaging is efficient. Yeah. And it's an, it's an interesting process to how do you reduce what you, the waste that you're taking, um, using in the, in a, in a large company. Yeah. Yeah. Typically we see conversations about the environment solely as part of the sciences. How have you been able to incorporate it as part of your lessons? Sure. So what we do is, I, I especially for um, Earth Day, we went through and we did the individual consumer and how we talked earlier about the bottle of water. Yeah. And we talked about that. And we do the math and we do it out to 10 years. And it's a ton of money. Yeah. And we look at that. And we look at individual actions. Same with using um, um, reusable bags versus using plastic bags or paper bags. How much can you save? And we talk about the impact of the individual. We also talk about it from a consumer perspective. Because it's not about what I call greenwashing, mm -hmm. where you, you 
want to look good to your the consumer, but you actually want to make hardcore changes. And we go through and we talk a lot about the reverse logistics and we talk about you know the car ward and how do you find that aftermarket for that product? And how do you find packaging that is efficient that not only meets the need of the consumer that arrives to the consumer undamaged and unspoiled, but also that if there's an aftermarket for that, that that you know type five plastic, that there is something that can be used mm -hmm. in a in a secondary market. Yeah. So we talk a lot about that, and we talk about thinking from a new perspective, and we, that's why we talk about the I talked about the innovation earlier with Nike and Nike, and talk about how a small thinking outside the box can change the world, and we mm -hmm. talk about that. So we, we tie it in very much into the I tie it into the the. the definitely into the semester. Yeah. And we talk about it because these are the future leaders. And it's not just the sciences, but it's also it's everybody. And the reason business is so important is because a lot of the waste that is produced is consumer waste. And it's it's people that don't recycle. Um, City of Buffalo is trying to get to 34% recycle rate. Mm -hmm. You've seen the trucks, yeah. and they say 34 on the side, they're trying to get to 34. Oh, okay. So that means... Actually, I actually haven't seen that. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I passed one on the way here oh, okay. today, and it's they were picking, and they, that's their, their goal is thirty four. Well, that's a horrible way to recycle. Yeah. <laughs> that's very minimal. <laughs> it's, that means two thirds of the people are not recycling. Yeah. And in, in so many places, and I'll give you an example, are not set up for it. Like for yeah. example, apartment buildings often don't have recycling available. Some people have had to pack their. I know people who have packed their recyclables and they take it to their parents' house mm -hmm. because their parents have recycling. Oh so. my gosh, I do that here. You do? Okay. Yeah, um, I have, well, so all my, because I live close, I'm like mm -hmm. one of the only ones who lives close mm -hmm. in my like building. A lot of my friends, they bring, I have literally a pile of recycling in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then I bring it to my house mm -hmm. because there's little to no places in village to recycle. Right. So, but yeah. it, it is, but it's about them making it easy for people to do, mm -hmm. you know, and so the 34%, like in Buffalo, there's more apartment buildings, you know, than other parts of the world or the community. You know, so for example, they may not, they probably don't have curbside recycling. Mm -hmm. So all of those things, uh, it's it's an interesting thing, but it's sad. Two thirds of the people don't even think of it. Oh my gosh, yeah. And just but making it uh, visible. And um, you know, years ago there was a commercial. Um, I think we talked about it before. Is of a, a person, an anti littering campaign. Was oh in the, yes. Like early seventies. Definitely, yeah. And and this. Uh, you said uh, that to me. The Native American person is just horrified by how the. The earth is being destroyed by people's carelessness of littering, mm -hmm. and it's not only littering, but it's also getting taking that mess, except not just throwing it into the wild, but also taking it and, and making a new use for it through recycling. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's a fascinating commercial, but it was it, again people still talk about it years later because the, you know people like don't want to carry that water bottle like a couple yards to the, the recycle bin; they yeah. want it right near them, and those are the kind of things is getting people to understand that. So yeah. Can you speak to using your purchasing power to make the world a better place? Absolutely. People don't understand the power of their dollar. And I always say that when people make a choice, we call it in the industry, we call it the driveway decision. Mm -hmm. Where am I going to go? And now it's more like a computer decision. Sometimes, no, definitely. you know, you know like we're talking about Amazon. Oh, yeah. 100%. And people will often, you know, complain that a store is closing or their favorite coffee shop is going out of business. Because, but they, if they don't patronize it, we're not supporting it. And you're voting with your dollars. Every time you open your wallet, you're deciding who's going to be there. I support my local Wegmans. I, Wegmans is very good with sustainability. They do a lot of locally sourced produce. They do a lot of really good things. So a lot of times I will pay a little more for Wegmans because I believe in the mission. You know, I love, you know, I love other stores too, but I oftentimes support my local one. Not just, I don't go to the big ones. Mm -hmm. I have a small one near my house in Masonic and I, I love it because yeah. it's a little bit smaller and I make sure I support it because I don't want that to go out of business and then us not have a Wegmans in Masonic, right. for example. And same with like a small bookshop. If you, you know, it's easier, you know, maybe buy it on Amazon, it might be easier to, you know, buy it at Barnes & Noble, but, you know, by supporting that small bookstore, it's a good thing to support a local merchant. Yeah. who employs local people, may have um, made contributions to teams and things like that. So it's a very important to, you know, really look at who you're supporting. And it, and I believe passionately in that because that's how you decide. Amazon's a very easy decision. You click, and it's not that I have anything, it's a very efficient, very good model. But the reality is, is as they get bigger, you're going to see costs go up. Mm -hmm. And because as competition disappears, the incentive to provide the best price to the consumer disappears. Because, you know, like, for example, years ago, um, there was a big complaint against Walmart because Walmart was driving out all the small merchants. 
and literally Walmart would move into the town, all the small merchants would go. And that's something that realistically is very sad. And they were kind of ruthless with buying power and things like that. You know, they would, well, you know, we'll just pull, we'll go to another vendor. Mm -hmm. And then they get lower costs and things like that. So it's very important to roll, to think with your purchases and to really know who you're buying from. Sometimes Walmart's an easy decision, sometimes Amazon's an easy decision, but is it the best decision? Yeah. You know, like right now, all the malls are disappearing mm -hmm. because people have voted with their dollars that they didn't want to go there. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of sad. You see these giant places that are now being closed, like Eastern Hills and Boulevard, um, and the, the mall proper is closed. The outside merchants are still there. But the reality is, is consumers voted with their dollars that they didn't want that experience anymore. Mm -hmm. And they also, the, the merchant also did not provide a fun experience, too. They didn't make a provide a service that was different than an online service. So there's yeah. there's things both, but always vote. With, I always tell people vote. You vote with your dollars, and that decides who who survives in business. Yeah, we were talking about before when, when you were saying like, is it more efficient for Amazon to bring something to a store? Well, that takes away like the people have to go there to the store then. Mm -hmm. It's not delivered to their door. Mm -hmm. It's the thing about convenience and it being. Absolutely. Like you were talking about the bags too, it being right there. Well, that's why Amazon is so popular. It gets delivered to your door. Absolutely. And I don't think that people, I don't know, like people not necessarily, I think people like the mall, but I don't think they're like, oh, it's not as convenient as like getting Absolutely. it delivered. And they don't realize that because they're ordering off of Amazon more, they're voting with their dollar that they don't want to go to the mall now because 100% yeah yeah so that's absolutely so interesting and and you know and sometimes ordering online is not always efficient I always tell people never buy shoes and dresses online unless you know that merchant you yeah. know what I mean? unless you know how they run because so often those especially don't always follow traditional sizing mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying like and you know that you've probably had that experience yeah we order something it looks great on the you know the to okay. which uh, <laughs> the image, little the little, exactly, it looks, it looks great. Yeah. But then when you actually see it, the, the fabric might not be to your liking, the fit might not be to your liking. So there's differences. Yeah. You know, sometimes like, um, you know, you, those, but those two categories are where you get the most returns, that and swimwear. Those are like the three biggies that I always tell people, use caution. Sometimes it's so much better to try it on and, and rather than buy six of it and then shipping it back. Yeah. You know, and each, but it's, it's not always convenient to ship it back. Definitely, and usually a lot of the times they, they can't use it after you try it on and send it back, mm -hmm. right? And so then you're just wasting so much, especially oh. if you order six dresses, then like Absolutely. five of them are yeah. going to waste. Yeah, and they, they probably go to what they call liquidation, where they then end up somewhere down the road. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, as long as the tags are on, they probably will go to like a, what they call a liquidator, where it will end up like at a... Um, like maybe a Gabe's or something like that, where um, which is like a they buy liquidation stuff. Yeah. yeah, we have um a spot near my house. It's called Under One Roof, and they have like the out of season um Target, Marshall. Oh really? Stuff like that. Yeah, it's okay. an Alden. Oh, I've never heard of that. Yeah, yeah, and they have like good prices and stuff like that. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I've never heard of that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, what are some ways in which you make earth friendly choices in your life? Sure. So. One of the things, um, you know, first of all, we already talked about the water bottle. We talked about the, yeah. you know, the um, the bags for the grocery store. All those things are important. But also even like, for example, when you select a car, you know, I look at, you know, like right now, electronic, electric vehicles are very, everybody's talking about them. What I would always do, because I would have an hour commute, is I always look for fuel efficiency within a gas model because the fuel efficiency was huge. Mm -hmm. So I was able to pick a car that had 30 something miles to the gallon and that was much more eco-friendly and, and easier in my wallet yeah. than even buying a more expensive electronic e-vehicle or whatever. But the reality is, is, is that was something that I did. I also grouped my errands together so I reduce using gas. And I try to keep everything um, as far as like at my house, I do composting. I do all of these things to reduce use. I also create, I'm very list-driven now, which is funny because the pandemic kind of yeah. forced it into me, but it makes me a better shopper with less food waste mm -hmm. because now I plan the meals yeah, rather definitely. than just going to the store and saying, oh, this looks good. Or, oh, yeah, really shopping good. with your eyes. Like, oh, my gosh. Yeah. Or you're shopping when you're hungry. Oh, 100%. 100%. <laughs> yeah. You spend so much more yeah. when you're shopping when you're hungry because it's like, oh, my God, that looks so good. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you, you, the same person that makes that decision to buy it may not be the same person who was set to cook it. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? Because then all yeah. of a sudden you're like, 
oh, I've got to do all these steps, or I got an hour of prep work to do, yeah. and it's then it's not as, as appealing, you know. Mm -hmm. And even like we talk about um, one of the things um, like shopping more efficiently, the less food waste, um, composting, making the you know reducing the amount I'm spending as far as like I don't need any more clothes, so I'll shop in my closet. You know, yeah. all those small decisions are huge. Uh, but even something that we talked about um, at one of our meetings uh, for the committee. We talked about learning, teaching college kids to cook. Yeah. And I learned to cook later in life, and I love it. But it also is so much more environmentally friendly than buying takeout. Yeah. Because there's all those plastic containers and all that, you know, that comes in these giant bags and DoorDash or whatever you get. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, if I could cook. And then, you know, you, you know, use more vegetables. I cook with more vegetables now than I used to. All these things that are better for the earth mm -hmm. that you don't even think about. And right. many college kids don't know how to cook. You know, and I know I was guilty. I was one of them raising my hand, you yeah. know, because my mom was an amazing cook. So I yeah. never really learned to cook until later in life. And sure enough, I love it. And, but the reality is, is by decreasing the amount you order from takeout is a huge benefit for the environment because, and for your wallet, because wa takeout is crazy right now. It's expensive. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> so what is your vision for sustainability on our my vision for sustainability is to first of all to make what to hit the, what I call the low hanging fruit yeah. and to really to hit those easy things like making uh, recycling easy for the dormitories for the apartment complexes to make it easy for people to instead of make it easier to recycle rather than just throw it in the trash and to reduce the footprint in terms of the recycling I think that's a huge easy thing that when you go to an event there should be a, a place to put your recycle. Um, pop bottle or a beer bottle or whatever and it should be easy mm -hmm. and then that way it's, it doesn't go into the trash yeah. and I think reducing the amount of trash is an easy first step for it and then the other thing that I think is more is a, is a tougher one is to changing a heart to have a metanoia to having a, people actually change their heart with how they approach recycling and green initiatives so often we try to politicize it as a, co a country and the reality is is every I think every person doesn't want a, a river that's polluted. I think every person does not want to step over garbage or walk on broken beer bottles at the beach. And the reality is, is we sometimes make it very political, and but the reality is is we want to be good to the earth because it's good for all of us. Definitely. It's good for animals, it's good for um, plants, it's good for wildlife because it, it's, it's better for the environment. And I think that's the harder thing because at Canisius University, you're creating the next generation of leaders. Mm -hmm. And by putting it into their mind and their consciousness and make them aware that it's again it's not a thing oh you're a tree hugger you're this <laughs> the reality is is that everyone wants to be in a park that's clean everybody wants to walk on a street where you're not walking past garbage and debris and and all those things so it's by making people conscious and i think that's my ultimate vision for the university that's awesome is there anything you'd like to add well, I, first of all, I want to compliment you on all your efforts thank on you. uh, your green initiatives. I love looking forward to your emails. Thank you, thank you. The podcasts have been great, and yeah. it's great to learn so much about the different departments Definitely. and what they're doing. Yeah. And I think you've done a great job, so I want to thank you for that and taking such a leadership role on campus. Thank you. And I, I know you're going to do great things. I'm not sure what you're going to do yet, but I know, <laughs> you're going to, I know you're going to do great things. And your passion and your um, enthusiasm for the Earth-Friendly Initiatives, I think you're going to go, you're going to go be very successful. In thank you so life. much. I so really appreciate this time. conversation. I okay. think it's so important for everyone to hear. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Gavin. Thank you.